We would like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience attending this webinar on understanding force majeure and assessing legal strategies. Thank you for taking out the time to be with us today. Depending on whichever part of the world you're in, we wish you a very good morning, good afternoon, or a good evening. Before we kick off, we acknowledge that we are all beaming this uh, from the comfort of our homes, but there are families out there battling the COVID menace, and we hope and pray and wish them a speedy recovery. This, um, this webinar is being led by Mr. Sanjeev Kapoor, myself, Bharat Anand, and Mr. Abhinav Bhushan. As I mentioned, I'm joined by Sanjeev Kapoor, who is a partner in the dispute resolution practice of Khetan and Company in Delhi. Sanjeev has over 20 years of experience in representing group companies, multinationals, private equity firms before domestic courts, as well as in international arbitrations. He regularly advises on complex cross-border litigations, disputes arising in private equity and venture capital, in the private equity and venture capital space, as well as on litigations in the infrastructure, banking, and security sector. Mr. Abhinav Bhushan is the regional director for South Asia, ICC arbitration, and alternate dispute resolution at the ICC International Court of Arbitration in Singapore as director, Abhinav focuses on helping companies, investors, and attorneys in the region understand how they can effectively resolve international commercial disputes, raising awareness on the ICC's dispute resolution services and its commitment to international arbitration, the arbitration procedure, as well as a thought leadership. Mr. Bhushan is also co-chair of the Asia chapter of the ICC Young Arbitrators Forum. I, Bharat Anand, am a partner at Khetan and Company, specializing in matters relating to mergers and acquisitions, corporate advisory matters, solvent restructuring. I'm a dual qualified lawyer, being both India qualified and UK qualified, worked in the UK for around nine years before returning to India. Let me give you an overview of what we have for you this in this presentation. Bear with me, I'm trying to get to the agenda slide. So can we get to the agenda slide, please? So let me give you an overview of what we have installed for you uh, during this webinar. We will firstly be understanding force majeure clauses because uh, uh, entrenched uh, in terms of the disputes that will, will arise on account of COVID is the concept of force majeure. And so it's important for parties to understand uh, what is force majeure, what is frustration, how are the concepts different. But practically, and this is the focus of this webinar, how do you invoke force majeure? And at the other end of the equation, how do you resist a force majeure claim if you happen to be on the receiving end of a force majeure claim? We will look at governmental measures in relation to COVID-19 and discuss various circulars uh, that have been passed by the government, but also importantly, how have the courts interpreted these circulars and how does this interplay with your legal strategy? We will be discussing the latest ICC force majeure clauses launched by the ICC as recently as March 2020 and the potential benefit of including these clauses in future contracts. Lastly, we will have some time to take questions from the audience. So just in terms of the format for today's webinar, before we get into substance, uh, this webinar has been set up as an interactive session. So you can submit questions online at any time during the webinar and uh, in the Q&A session at the end. We will try and cover the substantive presentation in about 50 minutes cumulatively and have a 10 minute Q&A at the end, which will provide you with an opportunity to raise the questions that you have. Uh, procedurally, to submit a question, simply use the facility provided 
in the webinar portal. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as we can. If we cannot answer all your questions in the Q&A session, we will do so offline uh, through an email. And a copy of the presentation will also be sent to you um, after the webinar. So <clears throat> COVID clearly is a human tragedy and a massive disruption of the global economy on an unprecedented scale. Even before the onset of this pandemic, commentators and analysts had forecasted growing turbulence in the global economy on account of trade flow and had predicted an increased risk of a global recession. COVID has drastically aggravated the situation with disruptions and shocks to the demand side, supply chains, and liquidity. Stock markets have plummeted, increasing number of parties are defaulting on contractual obligations, defaulting on financial prerequisites and conditions, defaulting on timelines of performance. The shape and speed of recovery in the US and China will be a, clear, uh, a key factor in determining the nature and the traction of the global economic recovery. However, reality closer home is that businesses are faced with uncertainty as to their business plans, with no clear precedence from the past to provide guidance. Due to this high level of uncertainty, parties need to brace for the prospect of litigation. A well thought out legal strategy requires some understanding of the legal implications of this pandemic outbreak on contracts, potential outs from performance, and the consequences of invoking force majeure or pleading frustration. Sanjeev, over to you. Thank you, Bharat. And good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to everybody, depending upon for which part of the world you have logged into this webinar. And thank you for attending this webinar. So as a journal metal, like our other common law jurisdictions, Indian courts will seek to enforce the bargain that parties have struck. However, there can be some limited exceptions to this. We will consider force major and frustration during the course of our webinar as those exceptions. Force major is a common clause in legal contract that allows either party to limit their liability in the face of some unforeseeable extraordinary event. The purpose is to allow the parties to contractually allocate their risk in relation to occurrence of future events in circumstances as are stipulated by the clause. Force major clause provides for certain pre-agreed outcomes like excusing performance, delay, or other measures in certain pre-agreed situations. However, one needs to keep in mind that force major is not an automatic right. Force major will apply if the contract expressly provides for it and is subject to various other considerations. Now, moving on to frustration, frustration is not a contractual right like force major, but it is rather a statutory remedy under Section 56 of the Indian Contract Act. In the absence of force major, in a, if in a contract, parties can examine if frustration will allow them to opt out of the contract. The doctrine of frustrations operates to excuse performance of obligation on the basis of some supervening impossibility or act becoming unlawful after the parties enter into the contract. The standard of proof for frustration would generally be higher than that of a force major. Now let's examine these opt-out provisions in some detail. So what are the key considerations before you can invoke force major? As discussed, force major clauses are not a feature of all the contracts, but where they have been used, parties are at liberty to agree upon events to include or exclude in their respective force major clauses. Force major clause could be inclusive, exclusive, or have a combination of both elements. Generally, force major clauses include wartime restrictions, change in law, act of God, such as fire, earthquake, or other natural disasters. So I think the first and foremost thing one needs to do is a very careful examination of express and implied terms of the contract, which is needed to be carried out. And it is to be determined whether the event claimed as force major is covered by the contract for checking for the applicability of some force major clauses in the present situation of COVID-19. One would need to examine does the force major clause cover an epidemic or a pandemic or government sh shutdown? If so, it will be a clear and straightforward case 
because the World Health Organization has labeled COVID-19 as a pandemic. However, if it is not clear, one would need to examine what the other causative events are. Is the change in law contemplated as a force major event? How has law been defined in the contract? The lockdown order has been passed pursuant to legislation that is Section 10.2 of Disaster Management Act 2000. It might get covered under that. Is there a catch-all or residual provision that includes any event beyond the reasonable control of the party? Or are there references to acts of God or natural disaster? There is no clear precedent of such clauses having been interpreted to cover pandemics and establishing COVID-19 coverage on this basis. These may not be straightforward. However, how the clause is worded and nature of the contract, there is a possibility that, that such clauses being interpreted by court. So for a force measure defense to be successful, there has to be a very strong nexus between the force measure event and hindrance to performance of the contract is required to be established to claim that benefit. That is, there has to be a cause between what is the force major event and what is the consequences of that. Event. The party seeking to benefit from the force major clause must demonstrate that it would have been able to perform its obligation, but for the force major event. In the present scenario, it needs to be seen whether contractual compliance could have been achieved despite the impact of COVID-19, or is a party using the force major as a mere excuse to shield a breach? Check jurisdiction provisions and governing law of the contract. This is particularly relevant for cross-border contract since force major provisions may be interpreted differently in various jurisdictions. Also examine the clause for effect and consequences. You need to examine and assess as to what are the contractually agreed outcome. Does this permit a delay or suspension in performance or does it act as a carve out to liability or does it confer a termination right? Force major clauses often require mitigation action on the part of the party seeking to assert it. Party claiming force major is generally expected to demonstrate that despite taking reasonable steps to mitigate, performance was not possible for reasons beyond its control. What is a reasonable measure is largely fact dependent question. Force major clauses often require the non-performing party to adhere to certain procedural requirements as conditions precedent to invocation, like notice of invocation may be required to be given within a specified time of happening of the causative event. It may be required that some third party proof needs to be furnished while invoking force major. It is advisable that you follow that. Now, how to invoke a force major clause? So once you examine the clause and you think that there exists ground, you may invoke force major. While invoking, first and the foremost, it is very important to closely examine the force major clause in your contract. As explained earlier, the clause may have stipulations regarding time, form, content, mode of service of a force major. Adherence is most important to avoid any procedural challenge. There are various factors which will influence the content of the notice, like what is your end goal? Before invoking the force major clause in your contract, it is imperative to strategize the goal. That is whether you want a suspension of performance obligation, avoid delay liquidated damages claim against you, suspend performance of your contract, or altogether terminate the contract. Obviously, all of this will depend upon the terms of your contract. Additionally, many agreements will require that notices specify the force major event, its impact on performance, and the probable duration of the impact. It is important that you clearly set out the causative link between the force major event and the obligation sought to be excused from the notice. Form of a notice involves a check of who needs to send the notice and to whom it must be sent and within what time and by what mode of service. Please comply with all these requirements. A claim of force major can be defeated if it can be shown that the non-performing party did not take reasonable step within its control to mitigate the impact of force major events. Detail out the steps you had taken or that no such alternate methods of performance exist. Have written records, including correspondence, email, minutes of meeting, etc. These are critical to establish your case. The records must demonstrate that the force major event was unavoidable and beyond your control, was duly intimated to the counterparty, that reasonable mitigation measures were adopted. Engage with the counterparty for arriving at an amicable solution. It may be best way forward. However, it is imperative that amicable settlement discussions are carried out on a without prejudice basis, as there is always a very real possibility of the counterparty 
seeking to litigate the matter in the event the settlement discussions do not rectify. Strategize based on the review of the contract. The strategy should be aligned with your overall business objective and not merely a legal battle without a commercial goal in mind. Prepare your strategy basis, the strength of your claim, and the outs available to you in the event you succeed. However, it's quite possible that you are the party who is wanting to resist a force major claim. Then what is to be done? I think you need to do the same things, but in a reverse manner. Can we have the next slide, please? So how to resist a force major claim? Please check whether the force major provision directly covers the event in question. That is, does it have a specific language such as epidemic or pandemic? If not, does it have a catch-all provision or generic language such as act of God, natural calamity, disaster? If yes, examine whether by applying a rule of legal interpretation, it can be argued that such phrases do not include reference to a health crisis. For instance, in one case, delay in delivery of a housing project was defended by builder seeking recourse to a clause which excused performance in the event of lockout, strike, slowdown, war, enemy action, etc. The builder relied on the financial recession to claim that slowdown had taken place in the real estate sector. The term slowdown was, however, read with the surrounding words, such as lockout and strike, concluding that the term can only mean deliberate acts of slowing down building and construction activities initiated by construction workers as a mark of protest and does not cover financial decision. So it is possible that while contracting the party use the word in a specific context, which can be quite opposed to what the word in ordinary, ordinary terminology may mean. Examine if there are any express or implied exclusions, like some contracts specifically exclude a rise in price from being claimed as a force major. Also examine the foundation on which the claim is being premised. Is it on price or market fluctuations or difficulty in performance? If yes, then there is case law which suggests that economic burden cannot be the basis of a force major claim. Assess whether performance was in fact prevented or hindered by COVID-19 or whether the counterparty would have regardless of the pandemic defaulted in its obligation. If it can be shown that regardless of the pandemic, the counterparty was not in a position to perform its obligation, the claim of force major can be weakened. Examine if the causative event directly impacts the obligations under the contract. If not, it is arguable that a force major condition has not arisen under the terms of the contract in question. Check if the notice complies with the form, content, and mode of service stipulated in the contract. Examine if there was any alternative means of performance or mitigation options which were available to the counterparty. If so, you may have a good case to resist the invocation of force major. Strengthen your position by communicating your side of the facts with the counterparty in a timely and a very cogent manner. Check for entitlement to forfeit security de deposit or invoke securities. Seek legal guidance on what are the remedies available to you. Can you make a claim of damages for breach? Can you in turn suspend performance of your obligations, if any, under the agreement claiming breach of the counterparty? Can you ask for specific performance of a part of the contract to the extent obligations set out in that part are severable and unaffected by the event? Moving on to frustration, let's see what the key considerations for frustration are. Can we have the next slide, next slide please? So these are the key considerations for frustration. Frustration under Indian law also excuses a party from performance of its obligations provided the test of frustration under section 56 of the contract is met. This limits the concept of frustration basically to impossibility or lawfulness. However, impossibility for maintaining a claim of frustration is not to be construed in its literal sense. In order to succeed, a party needs to demonstrate that the performance of the contract is impractical and useless from the point of view of the object and purpose which the parties had in view at the time of entering into the contract. However, the test by reference to impossibility also does not mean that commercially inconvenient transactions can be avoided. Precedents established 
that mere difficulty or increased cost or hardship will not be su sufficient to establish frustration. Law as declared by Indian Supreme Court is that courts have no general power to absolve a party from the performance of his part of the contract merely because its performance has become onerous on account of an unforeseen turn of events. Also, performance may be a ground to reject a plea of frustration of contract. For instance, in an English case, it was argued that a contract of sale was frustrated due to closure of Suez Canal. The alternative route around the Cape of Good Hope was three times the distance, and the freight for such a journey was double. Despite this, the House of Lords held that even though the contract had become more onerous to perform, it was not fundamentally altered. Duration as to temporary versus longer term impossibility is likely to turn on whether time is of the essence in the contract. But in general, longer term impossibility is more likely to establish fr frustration than shorter term issues. In the event you are able to pass the high bar of frustration, what are the consequences of frustration? Can we have the next slide, please? So the outcome would depend on the facts and circumstances of each case, but the most common one would be restitution. If frustration is established, the party affected by the failure of the counterparty's performance is not without remedy. As frustration results in contract being treated as void, restitution would thus be an option to a non-defaulting party. Also, if only a part of the contract is frustrated with some part being capable of performance, or if the contract can be split into separate sets of obligation, then the party seeking performance may still have recourse to specific performance of the parts which are still capable of being performed. And the counterparty fails to establish that frustration applies, the party seeking performance can assess whether and to what extent the normal remedies for breach, such as damages or specific performance are available to it. It is important to note that unlike force major, Frustration does not merely operate to suspend a contract. Frustration renders a contract void and brings it to an end. Now that we have briefly gone through these concepts, let's look at some decided cases as to how courts have dealt with these concepts. Obviously, the cases have much detailed reasoning, but idea of the next slides is to just very briefly examine how courts dealt with in a given situation. Can we have the next slide, please? So now what you see on screen is the case slide. There will be a poll at the end to answer whether in your assessment, the claim of force major was upheld or not. So very briefly, the facts were that A entered into a power purchase agreement with B to generate and supply power with a tariff containing a component of non escalable energy charge. The coal was being procured from Indonesia. The price of coal in Indonesia drastically increased after a change in law event happened in Indonesia. This made electricity generation based on agreed fixed tariff unfeasible. A rise in the price of coal was carved out from force major by an exclusionary clause in the agreement. The contract also had a change in law clause, which defined law to mean Indian law. A claimed relief on account of force major change in law and in alternative also pleaded frustration. What is your view? Do you think A succeeded? Can we have the poll please? Can we have the results? So 33% of people think that A succeeded and 67% of people think that uh, A did not succeed. And the court 
sided with the majority in this particular case. They had, they did hold uh, that A's claim of force major and frustration was rejected by the Supreme Court of India. It was held that the power purchase agreement was not permised on the price of coal import, imported from Indonesia. And alternative modes of performance were available to A, albeit at a higher price. Change in law could not be invoked as a contractual definition of law did not include foreign law. And as, as you remember, this was Indonesian law and not Indian law. Force major could not be pleaded as a rise in the price of coal was specifically carved out from force major by an exclusionary clause in the agreement. And more importantly, once it was held that rise in the price of fuel cannot be regarded as a force major event, contractually, the alternative plea of frustration was not available. Let's have one more uh, case study. Can we have the next slide, please? So in this case, a dispute arose under a contract of supply of wagon, which delayed A in supplying wagons, leading to imposition of liquidated damages by B. Wagons were to be manufactured according to the key drawings listed in the bid document, and those drawings were to be supplied by B to A. The agreement contained a force major clause, which also included an event beyond the supplier's control, such that it is not foreseeable and does not involve supplier's negligence. A relied on the force major clause, contending that delay in supplying the wagon were attributable to B and as such were beyond its control. Do you think A succeeded in its claim before the force major? Can we have uh, the poll, please? Can we have the results, please? So 57% of people say that A succeeded. And 43% of people say A did not succeed. And like the previous slide, the majority out here also uh, wins in, in, in the sense that that is the decision which the court also took. The court said, that A's claim of force major is upheld. Court held that the force major clause was wide enough to cover any event beyond A's control, barring its own fault, negligence, or presence of foreseeable event. Now, why we chose these two cases? This was to just give you an indication that exercising these opt-out clauses will also be very heavily fact-dependent. Court will see the overall contract, the clause, the carve-out events, what meaning is to be given to such carve-out events, and all associated facts. This is the reason as to why, though, at the first blush, the cases looked optically very similar in fact, but with varying degrees of results to challenge. As we spoke, as we speak, the courts are entertaining particular issues which have been triggered by COVID-19. There has been orders, directions, and circulars which are being passed by the government, which are being considered by courts. I will request my partner, Bharat, to take you through some of them very briefly. Bharat, over to you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Can we have the next slide, please? So while there has been a lockdown very clearly and we're all feeling it, the government has been quite busy. I will not take you through all the circulars and notifications that have been issued, but really to say that they have come in various shapes and forms and from various authorities. Call it notification, circular, advisory, whether to the public sector by the government or to the private sector uh, in relation to the scope of the lockdown, carve outs for certain sectors like logistics or essential services, mandates uh, regarding payments to employees or their relating to their retrenchment, uh, advisories relating to the same. And then, of course, the whole talk about reopening operations. Now, while the form of such delegated legislation is wide ranging, there is clearly a juxtaposition of such legislation, both from the central government and the state government. Office memoranda, circulars, FAQs, advisories 
each business person and his sagely legal counsel is probably trying to take an interpretation of what these really mean. So for example, someone may well argue that a government advisory results in impossibility of performance as practically movement on the ground is hindered and thereby goes to cancel delivery of a high value item. A counterparty might argue just the opposite, that the government's advisory is simply indicative and not binding and incapable of rendering performance impossible. Accordingly, the practical takeaway here is that when positions are being taken today, the effect of the government's actions and the impact on the ground should be documented carefully uh, in case the positions are contested tomorrow. Exit from lockdown will have a similar challenge. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to the RBI's uh, stimulus package, which was issued on the 27th of March. Uh, in the broadest form, the RBI's package sets out two uh, measures. Uh, conceptually, it is the moratorium on repayment of all term loans, including interest, for the period between 1 March and 31 March. Now, this moratorium on repayment is not automatic. One actually has to go to the bank, seek relief. Uh, not, not all types of financing is covered by the moratorium. So, and we, it, we will turn to it later when we look at the case law. Uh, LCs, uh, non convertible debentures, commercial paper are really not covered under the RBI's package. And secondly, the RBI has also stated that if you're availing of the moratorium, the changes in your credit terms, any credit extensions, will not be treated as a concession granted due to financial difficulties. Uh, and consequently, uh, these measures will not result in any asset classification downgrade. Uh, as Sanjeev mentioned, the RBI's package is already resulting uh, in a lot of litigation, and it is perhaps a precursor to what we will see in the very near future. But it's also admirable before we take you through the cases and the key principles that all of these matters have been uh, conducted virtually, uh, very commendable uh, for a country like India. So can I have the next slide, please? Transcon. So Transcon is an interesting case because payment default here occurred on the 15th of Jan and the 15th of Feb. And as per the RBI norms, asset classification uh, would occur on the 15th of April, and therefore there would be an NPA classification on the 15th of April. The question before the court was, since moratorium started on the 1st of March, should the 90-day NPA uh, clock also be suspended? Uh, the Bombay High Court in a writ petition uh, said that yes, it should, and granted relief to the borrower in terms of reclassification of the account as NPA, although the default that took place was outside the moratorium period. Uh, the Bombay High Court took the view that uh, the period of the lockdown started as of the 25th of March will not be considered for the calculation of the 90 day period uh, for assessing whether the account is NPA or not. But this deferral will cease immediately from the date of the lifting of the lockdown. Uh, can we have the next slide? Now, Anant Raj was really the precursor case uh, to the Transcon case. And again, I won't get uh, you know, too much into the facts. The basic facts um, are really that um, it was a question of whether the uh, borrower's classification from SMA to, to NPA could occur during the moratorium period. And again, the Delhi High Court really said that look, status quo will have to be maintained. And uh, during the moratorium period, there will be no downgradation of the borrower's asset classification. But the court also noted that if the borrower later fails to repay installments after the moratorium period, there would obviously be a change in the asset classification in accordance with the RBI's prudential guidelines. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Now, Shakuntla is, is, is also an interesting case. Um, here, the borrower is an educational institution. It defaulted on its installment again pre moratorium period. Installment was due on 31st of December. In accordance with the RBI guidelines, the account would have been declared NBA by 31 March unless there was a payment cure. Now, here the Delhi High Court again passed an interim order preventing the account from being classified as NPA. And this was on the basis that the UP government issued directions preventing the collection of fees from students and thereby preventing the petitioner from collecting amounts required to pay the installment. The court upheld the view in Anantaraj, Delhi High Court, 
and said that the intention of the RBI under the stimulus package is to maintain status quo with respect to asset classification with effect from 1 March 2020. Um, it also issued some directions in terms of payment uh, to the petitioner once the UP government withdraws its order preventing the collection of fees. Um, uh, can we have the next slide, please? So, <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, can we have the slide that says uh, rural fair price, please? Previous slide. Uh, one before this, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, so rural fair price, a very interesting facts, uh, and I'll spend some time on the facts here. So here, uh, rural fair price had actually issued NCDs, and IDBI was acting as trustee for the NCD holders. Now, importantly, there was no payment default in the NCD terms. What had happened is that the NCD holders had the benefit of collateral, and the collateral was the shares of a listed company, Future Retail. Now, the shares actually fed in value, and as a result of this, there was a pay, there was a covenant default, not a payment default, and the security coverage ratio under the NCD terms got breached. As a result of this, default notices were issued by IDBI as trustee, acting on behalf of the NCD holders, and thereupon IDBI went on to execute the pledge and sought to sell the shares of Future Retail, which were available as collateral for the NCD holders. The Bombay High Court was approached and it granted interim relief, restraining IDBI. IDBI from such sale. The court uh, said, and it actually established a link between the fall in the share price and said this was due to the effect of COVID on the stock market. And it was really outside the control of the borrower who had shown no signs of default uh, in the past and was willing to really pay any shortfall amount. So these are, you know, four strong illustrations. And I thought we should pause for some takeaways here. It's, it's clear that the judiciary, particularly the high courts, are taking a fairly pragmatic approach and being sensitive to the effect that COVID is really having on businesses. And even though courts have not extended the moratorium pe uh, period in terms of time, they seem to have extended the provisions relating to asset classification to defaults that have occurred prior to 1 March 2020. But what the case law really seems to indicate is that they will look at the behavior of the parties that are involved, particularly in relation to lenders' early dialogue um, or offering alternatives um, <clears throat> seems to have worked um, well in, in favor of parties. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, now standard retail is important because here the decision went slightly differently and you had a set of Indian buyers who were buying steel from Korean sellers. The buyers sought to get an interim relief under Section 9 of the Arbitration Act uh, in terms of restraining the sellers, uh, the Korean sellers, from in cashing uh, LCs. Now, uh, the buyers argued that their contract contained a force majeure clause, and they said that on account of COVID, the contracts actually stood terminated. Now, the Bombay High Court dismissed the petition, and it essentially said the following, that letters of credit are really independent transactions with the bank. The underlying dispute will not affect the performance of the letters of credit. And further, it took note of the fact that steel was already declared as an essential service by the government, and it is implied, therefore, that there are no restrictions in, it move, in its movement. Therefore, this was mere, merely a temporary inability to perform and will not really recuse the Indian buyers from their contractual obligations. So again, I want to contrast this from the earlier takeaways, because here, firstly, um, uh, we are talking about LCs and non-fund-based obligations, and we have to be very careful. Some of these were actually not covered by the terms of the RBI's stimulus package. Uh, secondly, crafting a legal strategy really depends uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, including the sector, the applicable state notification, central notifications. And one wonders that once the moratorium is over, I will courts deal with situations as technical defaults, um, particularly when the lockdown is also lifted in light of declining revenues and uh, falling uh, asset values. So uh, with this, I'd like to hand over to Abhinav. Thank you, uh, Bharat. Uh, I will very quickly speak about uh, the ICC force majeure clauses which have been introduced in March 2020, uh, which are 
in a sense, an extension of the ICC force majeure clause of 2003. Uh, now, the fundamental difference in the 2020 force majeure clause and 2003 force majeure clause, uh, and I'll draw those distinctions for your benefit. Now, one thing is clear, what are we really trying to uh, suggest to everyone by providing this force majeure clause, which is that these are meant for future contracts. Now, the 2020 clause comes in two different forms, the long form and the short form. The long form ICC force majeure clause can actually be incorporated by reference. You need not put the entire ICC force majeure clause, whereas the short form ICC force majeure clause needs to be directly incorporated into the contract. Uh, the difference is, of course, that the short form is the reduced version of the long form, and it's limited to certain essential provisions. It does not cover the entire exhaustive list of what the 2000 uh, of what the long form contract provides for. It has, in a sense, limited scope and does not cover all issues. For instance, it does not cover third parties' non-performance. The example uh, that uh, Sanjeev gave in the case law previously. Uh, it does not cover the concept of unjust enrichment. Um, but the good news is that both, in fact, uh, the 2003 long form contract clause and the 2020 clause provides that plague and epidemic are examples of presumed impediments that trigger the use of the clause. So if any of the contracts have had an ICC force majeure clause, whether 2003 and God forbid 2020, then a COVID-19 situation is likely to be covered insofar as the two requirements are concerned. And I'm going to talk about what those two requirements are. Um, next slide, please. Now, the 2020 clause essentially is simple and clear in language. I mean, and it's very, very user friendly for SMEs. It has a checklist uh, for bigger enterprises. You can customize what you want, what event you would want to be triggered as a force majeure. So there is a ready-made list of events in the 2020 clause. You can add, subtract, edit as you like. There's a definition of force majeure, which was earlier missing. Uh, there are different articles um, and there's a separate article for notices now. Uh, the presumed force majeure events, like I said, are more simplified, but the list in itself is enlarged. This clause is freely available on the internet, so I will not bore you with, uh, with reading the entire clause, but insofar as COVID-19 is concerned, it, it, it includes pandemic and endemics uh, in it. Uh, some of the things that have has been added is currency and trade restrictions, embargo, sanctions, um, and of course, in the new 2020 clause, if the impediment exceeds beyond 120 days, then either party has the right to terminate the contract uh, under the 2020 clause. These are the two, I mean, this is, this is perhaps the highlight of the ICC force majeure clause 2020. But in the next part of my presentation, which is perhaps for another five or seven minutes, uh, next slide, please, I will go through some of the cases, and I've read hundreds of them in the last 20 days or so. And, and while I was at the ICC in Paris, I'd had the benefit of administering many cases, many of which were actually force majeure for different reasons. Now, what I am going to talk about is how the Indian law and how law generally has evolved around the world uh, when it comes to a force majeure event. Now, what is most important in any event, uh, whether it's an Indian case or it's a tri ICC tribunal, the tribunal is likely to look at three core aspects. And Sanjeev, of course, very helpfully took us through them before, which is it requires the party invoking the clause to prove that the impediment is beyond the party's control. The impediment could not reasonably have been foreseen when the contract was concluded. And the effect of the impediment could not have been avoided or overcome by the party. These are essentially, give or take, three broad principles when you're looking at a force majeure event. And these are in turn derived from, you know, the Latin principle of factus and servanda, which is a Latin term. And it means that the agreement must be kept. The parties must adhere and give sanctity to what they have agreed in about. However, you know, the problem that I see, foresee at least with Indian parties in Indian contracts, 
going forth is this. And this is again, after reading through scores of cases, I realized that the problem is that the parties frequently adopt more or less standardized boilerplate language as a force majeure event, act of God clause, instead of really tailoring force majeure provisions to their actual risks. So whilst, of course, there would be many contracts where big law firms in India uh, or the contract has been drafted properly, where a time was put into it and a force majeure clause was drafted properly, my sense is that majority of the, of the contracts are going to have you know, broad and unspecific language of force majeure clauses. They will have catch-all phrases like any other impediments beyond the parties' control. And, and therefore, the certainty to all this ambiguity now comes from you know, the, inter the legal interpretation of multiple cases across various jurisdictions from Article 79 of the CISG and Article 7.17 of the UNITRA. And those three broad principles are the ones that are on the screen and I just stated. Now, in a situation like COVID-19, and especially if you have an ICC force majeure clause, I think it would be less cumbersome to prove the first two requirements. That is, the impediment is beyond the parties' control, easy, easy, and the impediment could not reasonably have been foreseen when the contract was concluded. After reading a lot of cases, again, I realized the first two are perhaps easier to persuade people to for with. The problem is going to come in the last one, that the effects of the impediment could not have, could not have been avoided to overcome or overcome by the party. And one particular issue that I foresee coming is the liquidity issue in the COVID-19 situation. Now, majority of the cases suggest that generally liquidity issues are no ground for an exemption to perform one's duty. And in this regard, I have a couple of very interesting cases, and I'll just go through them very briefly. In the Tandrian Aviation Holdings, um, respondent basically bought jet aircrafts from Clement for about 31 million US dollars. And after making the initial payment, uh, respondent failed to take delivery or make further payments. Respondent relied on an unanticipated, unforeseeable, cataclysmic sort of an event of a downward spiral of the world's financial markets. Claimant, of course, said that, look, this is not the case. And the court held that, look, it is well established under English law, because the governing law of the contract was English law, that a change in economic market affecting the profitability of a contract or the ease with which the party's obligations can be performed is not, nego is not regarded as being a force majeure event. In another case, ICC case 18769 of 2014, again, a Dubai company failed to pay amounts due to claimant for two aircrafts. The Dubai company relied on several economic crises, and in particular, the economic downturn in 2008, the recession, the global recession. It argued that for reasons beyond its control, it became impossible for respondent to operate and exploit those jets. The leases at the time were governed by the state of Kansas in the United States of America. The sole arbitrator of the IC, the ICC sole arbitrator rejected Gulf's contention, uh, respondent's contention, because it said that, look, there is an overriding clause in the lease uh, that it, the obligations would not be discharged by any force majeure event. And, and more particularly, it went on, he went on to hold that even if there was an FM clause in the contract, which it did not provide so, the Kansas courts in the United States would not have likely extended the clause to include risks of changing economic and financial markets. The third one is the, the El Nino case. And very briefly, that respondent due to the meteorological phenomena called El Nino in Mexico, could not supply the product to claimant and claim that the occurrence of El Nino is a force majeure event. The sole arbitrator, again, rejected the claim because he thought that the occurrence of rainstorm and floods was foreseeable. Uh, what I also foresee in Indian clauses is the temporary impediments. I mean, you know, as Sanjeev explained, the broad difference between frustration and force majeure is that force majeure is perhaps temporary if I were to oversimplify it and uh, frustration is more permanent. It puts a contract to end. What I, def what I do foresee in the Indian contracts and the disputes coming about is that is this impediment under the COVID-19 lockdown situation is temporary, but what happens when this temporary impediment continues to be temporary when the impediment ends. So there is another case which I like very much of 
of Carbock's essay versus Louis de Fres, which says, um, next slide, please. Yes, uh, so in this case, what happened was the claimant entered into a contract with a claimant with respondent for the carriage of 10 cargoes of coal from Indonesia to Spain in the use for the use of claimant's power stations. Respondent chartered four vessels. On the way, there was an official strike in Spain and an issue arose as to whether a delay at the Spanish port due to a nationwide strike and a subsequent unofficial stoppage by truck drivers was excluded from the computation of time for the charter. So in Indian cases, again, I foresee, you know, those trucks that are lying on, uh, that are on the highway, the, the delivery of, of materials that is being, that will be disrupted, continues to be disrupted. But even when the lockdown opens, the supply chain will not start on day one. The supply, supply chain will take some time uh, for to resume normalcy. How do you calculate that time? So in this case, uh, of course, this is an English law case. But uh, the, the question was whether the clause included delays caused by congestion at the port following strikes, because the strikes were already over when the vessels arrived at the port. Now, the arbitrator answered the question in the negative. The commercial court answered in the affirmative. Respondent appealed the decision of the commercial court, and the court of appeals upheld the decision of the commercial court and said that it was the parties' intention that the charterer should not only be protected from strikes that directly interfered with the cargo, but also from the effects of the strike that prevented or delayed the vessel entering berth in order to discharge. I mean, this perhaps suggests that the principle and effects of FM of a force majeure may extend beyond the time at which the event itself ends. Uh, I will probably end here uh, because we should take some questions and answers. Uh, and uh, what I will, however, just remind everybody who is still participating at the seminar is that today at 6.30, uh, there is a seminar, which perhaps I can talk a little bit more about uh, if there is a question about it. So Bharat, over to you. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Abhinav. We thought um, we can have a quick wrap up in terms of the practical considerations that um, uh, one should look at. So maybe if I could uh, just request for the next slide, please. And, uh, you know, if it's, um, uh, I can see questions have come in, but what we might do is, Sanjeev, if I could request you to do a quick wrap up of the practical considerations and maybe be run over by no more than five minutes. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, finish this slide and get some Q&A in as well. So, Sanjeev. Thank you, Bharat. I think to sum up, uh, 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 first and foremost, the critical factor which one has to keep in mind is contract management. And I cannot stress enough on this. It is critical to fully and completely understand the contract, monitor performance-related parameters of your contract very, very closely, and make sure that all your communications with the counterparty are duly recorded and archived. Ensure your communications do not prejudice your case at a later stage. Be very vigilant and constantly examine the impact of extraneous circumstances on performance of obligations, whether these are present or future. On risk assessment, explore merits of your claim and chances of your success. While statutes do provide guidance, it is treatment of the contractual exit class clauses to help you gauge practicality. Negotiate. As litigation and arbitrations are time consuming, costly, and for the large part uncertain, it is advisable to amicably try and resolve the dispute. Initiating an early dialogue with the stakeholder goes a long way in demonstrating your bona fides and sets a very favorable narrative for you at the dispute stage. Uh, legal strategy is also important. Taking your disputes to litigation and arbitration stage is a long term strategic decision. Potential factors which you might need to consider are reputational harm, loss of future business opportunities, something uncertainties. Have a very clear legal strategy right at the start, which is completely aligned with your business goals. Have a clear understanding of your strengths and weaknesses. Stay abreast of legal developments pertaining to your business. Risk 
exposure is also constantly evolving factor which depends upon regulatory and compliance indicate a number of updates and regulatory uh, notifications which are coming from time to time by the government on various issues it is very important to keep yourself updated with latest judgments and legal changes these changes may potentially pave the way for new remedies that perhaps you may not have even contemplated Given the circumstances we find ourselves in, central and state authorities have been notifying various regulatory and compliance measures and policies. Non-compliance may potentially expose your business to a heightened risk of legal implication. Be updated on this. And in case nothing works, you can contemplate a legal action which is very well founded on facts as well as law and can expect some sympathetic consideration. The crisis is unprecedented but courts would make a distinction between parties who are in genuine difficulty versus parties who are merely taking this as an excuse to wriggle out of their obligations with this i'll hand this over to bharat thank you uh, so much uh, sanjeev abhinav for your presentations uh, we now come to the q and a session and uh, this is an opportunity for the audience to raise issues of their importance uh, of importance to them and i can see some questions have come in so uh, sanjeev here is perhaps one which is best suited for you and um, um, i can say it's not a simple one in light of the various circulars and advisories issued by the central government and the constitutional divide between the center and the states can you shed some light on the justiciability enforceability and primacy of such circulars and advisories yeah bharat uh, it's a very interesting question it's a very interesting question and it can take one full seminar webinar on this uh, but i think one would need to go circular by circular or direction by direction uh, uh, so presently basically the kind of circulars which we are seeing or the directions which we are seeing are coming uh, essentially under two statutes one is obviously disaster management act uh and another is uh, a pandemic act uh, which is a very old historic act of 1897 uh and and generally uh, we are seeing that uh, under the disaster management act central government is passing the uh, uh, directions because obviously it's entitled to do so under that particular act and the state governments are more uh, so um, doing pa passing their directions under the pandemic act because they are they are um more empowered under that then we have got circulars which are coming from moef monre mha etc uh, so i think the basic thing which would one would need to look at is uh, uh the authority or the power was the circular or the notification or the advisory was that advisory passed by the relevant department which had got some statutory basis and legal competence for passing that kind of a uh, advisory or not and second thing i think which would be needed to be uh, understood would be whether that is directly relatable and 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 the sweep of the powers which are being exercised is directly relatable to what is the kind of direction which has been passed to, uh, like let's 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 see an example uh, we have seen uh, that lockdown is happening under disaster management act the powers are being exercised under that and i think there cannot be a doubt because obviously disaster management act is uh, specifically to prohibit response to any uh, uh, threatening uh, uh, kind of a disaster and within the de definition of uh, disaster is man made disaster also and this would definitely be uh, covered evacuation rescue relief rehabilitation all is there and therefore obviously if you if you look at disaster management act one could certainly say that uh, shutdown is permissible but then if you go a little deep down uh, then there are advisories which are getting issued now advisories are getting issued that you would not fire the employers or you will keep on paying the salaries etc now those incidental or secondary level issues whether the government had the power under the disaster management act to to pass those uh, whose obligation was it was uh, well uh, india being a welfare state whether the obligation was on the state essentially to see to it that people don't suffer because of this particular lockdown or could you have passed this on to private individuals 
So I think those would be really very, very kind of debatable uh, questions uh, which will come in. And uh, one would have to see circular by circular notification by notification, the particular exercise of the power and the fountainhead of that particular power, whether that power has been exercised uh, within the ambit of the statute and to the extent that the statute uh, provides and it is not excessive. But we will see very interesting challenges. I, I could anticipate quite a lot of interesting challenges, which will go down to the power of government also to pass some sec second level kind of measures which they are, uh, they, which they are doing. Thanks, uh, Sanjeev. Sounds uh, all far from being straightforward and simple. But thanks for uh, the clarifications. So, uh, Abhinav, we have a question here, um, you know, which is, um, really for you that in light of COVID and the lockup and courts, especially Indian courts responding to virtual hearings and the like, how do you see arbitration remaining competitive and what would be its advantages as we look ahead? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Bharat. Uh, Bharat, I think uh, the world of arbitration has very quickly metamorphosed itself if that's the word into a virtual setting so today uh, as far as the icc is concerned all offices of the icc court are operational everybody is working from home uh, we have advised everyone to communicate with the secretariat uh, by email i remain sort of the the hotline for people in india and in this part of the world uh, for any question related to uh, ICC. Now, insofar as the conduction of hearing is concerned and what the tribunals should do at this point in time, I don't want to really spoil the fun because there is a very high profile webinar today uh, at 6.30 with, with the Secretary General of the ICC Court, uh, Alexander Fessus and Ana Saramora, the Deputy Secretary General, where just yesterday the ICC Court has uh, issued guidance and has given out a note. The note essentially, uh, I believe it's a 13-page note for the possible measures aimed at mitigating the effect of COVID-19 pandemic. It's freely downloadable from the ICC's website. We have sent it to all the parties and all the tribunals as to how they wish, how they should look at this note and after looking at this note, how they should go and proceed with the hearings. Now, if you look at this note, and there's not enough time, uh, Bharat, to go into uh, the note, but that note essentially does everything that the courts are doing and perhaps much more secured lines, virtual hearings, where they can do it, what are the softwares that are currently in the world that are using, uh, that are being used in arbitrations, which ones are perhaps recommended by us, but we, of course, would not take liability, but that's what we see. There's a detailed note to the tribunals on, um, on the procedural orders, the annexures, the draft annexures and draft procedural orders have been provided in that note as to uh, how you want to select your platforms requirements, how you want, uh, and there are different, boxes where claimant can propose and respondent can propose and just like a red fund schedule what is tribunal's determination i think it's a fantastic note i'm I, not because you know it comes from the icc uh, i would encourage everyone to have a look at that note and i would also encourage everyone to log on to that webinar today it's free at 6 30 india time uh, and hear it all directly from the host's mouth uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Abhinav. Um, I, I'm afraid now we we are actually out of time. I realize it's um, lockdown, but people have things to do and to get on with their day. So let me please thank everyone for their questions, uh, for being um, a patient audience. We will respond offline to any questions that we have not been able to deal with today. Um, I hope you found the webinar interesting and a worthwhile investment of your time. We enjoyed bringing it to you. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact um, any one of us. Our contact details are uh, I, uh, on the screen. Uh, 
pages and the team at KCU has been very kind in broadcasting the registration link of tonight's today evening's seminar to all the audience. So I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to it, that it's there, they have to click and register, that's it. Terrific, thank you for your attendance today and we look forward to being of service again in the future um, at webinars organized by Kalpan and Company.